The locust is one of the most dreaded and destructive creatures on Earth. The very name evokes a primordial shudder in humankind that is echoed in the story of Moses and the eighth plague of Egypt. Just as the Bible describes it, a swarm of locusts can wreak a path of destruction that brings terror, famine, disease, and death. What's terrifying is not the individual, but the numbers, sort of like Alfred Hitchcock's bird. It's one bird isn't terrifying, but an entire flock of birds out to get you is horrifying. This perfect swarm can really bring starvation to entire country, to very large areas. And it happened many times in the historical past. There were millions of people that died from starvation. For centuries, and on every habitable continent on Earth, farmers and families trying to till the land and plant crops have witnessed the terrors wrought by swarms of locusts. It's almost as if a firestorm has come through. If you can imagine a raging fire with everything burnt down to the stubble, the only thing that's missing is, is ashes. I'm sure the fear that locusts strike in people's hearts ultimately probably dates back to the fact that plagues of locusts are mentioned in many of the religious texts, the Bible, Quran, Torah. In the book of Exodus, when the Egyptian pharaoh does not let the Israelites leave for the promised land, God sends a swarm of locusts to punish him and plague his lands. Exodus 10:15 states, they covered the face of the whole earth, so the land was darkened, and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees. And there remained not any green thing. The question always comes up, is this plausible? Could this have happened? Is this sort of just a completely fictive event? One, one reads Exodus, it turns out that the winds they talk about bringing the locusts, the, the winds are, they, I think they, they come on the east winds and are blown out on the west winds. These sorts of wind patterns are still the sorts of patterns that we expect to bring locusts to that area, say from the Red Sea zone over to the Nile. And so when you match up sort of the description of the winds that preceded the locusts and where the locusts uh, uh, landed and the sort of destruction they did, it seems entirely plausible. Entomologists believe that the species of locust in the biblical eighth plague was the desert locust. We know that particular species is the desert locust because that's the only species that occurs in northern Africa. Many times it was uh, found in Egypt and in nearby areas. The desert locust is a specific species of locust called Schistocircus gregaria and it has a huge range. It exists all the way from West Africa over into India, over in Asia. At a distance, a swarm of desert locusts, like the ones described in ancient texts, would have looked like a huge brown dust cloud. Experts believe the biblical swarm could have infested thousands of square miles. Usually, a swarm consists of several million locusts, more than 10 million locusts. Even with no wind, a desert locust swarm flies up to seven miles an hour. It seems as if it's just a weather event, uh, a cloud on the horizon, sort of a dark cloud. But this cloud, as it draws closer and closer, looks very different. It begins to shimmer. That's the light reflecting off the wings of the locusts. Um, and it draws closer and closer. It's at first just seem like hailstones because they, at the leading edge, they just sort of pelt a few at a time. And then they come faster and more furious and you realize that the storm itself is a swarm of locusts. Once the locusts get really close, you'll hear their wings flapping, so they'll make a, a crackling noise. Hundreds of millions of papery wings beating against the air and beating against the sides of the insect. That's this sort of thrum, humming, buzzing, sort of swirling sound. How a swarm chooses where to land is still a mystery. There's some indication that they are keen in on certain wavelengths of, of light, which, which are an indication of food, so they're looking for greens and yellows. The same way a, a traveler on the road would look for a, a sign that says McDonald's this way. Um, rather than golden arches, they're looking for green spots. When a locust swarm does touch down, devastation follows. Locusts, when they eat, they don't have jaws like humans do. They have what are called mandibles, and their mandibles move side to side in the front, and they cleave the vegetation and grind it a little bit before they swallow it. Even though an individual desert locust weighs only about half an ounce, experts calculate that a typical swarm of three-inch-long insects can inflict awesome destruction. It's often said that a locust eats its body weight in food a day. We're looking at somewhere around 200 tons of vegetation 
being destroyed by that swarm on a daily basis wherever it's settled. And it's not just crops that locusts devour. They will eat any kind of plant. They will eat trees. They will eat house if it's made of wood. By collecting and studying specimens, scientists hope to gain a better understanding of this voracious creature. The characteristics of desert locust is this long wing extending beyond the abdomen, and there are some spots on the hind wing. A locust is, in fact, a type of grasshopper. All locusts are grasshoppers, but not all grasshoppers are locusts. There are about 12,000 different species of grasshoppers, and only about a dozen, about 12 species of locusts in the world. Locusts differ from other grasshoppers in one very key trait. And the difference between a grasshopper and a locust is the way in which locusts respond to population density or crowding. Normal grasshoppers, if you put them in a crowd, they're just grasshoppers that are in a crowd. But locust species respond to crowded conditions and their biology, a lot of things about them change. It's really a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde transmorgification. When it finds itself in conditions of crowding or environmental stress, it undergoes a transformation. We call it a phase change. When this change happens, the locust looks radically different. First, the locust changes color in a process known as aposematism, which scientists today believe evolved as a biological defense mechanism designed to ward off predators. When they're in a crowd, they selectively pick out poisonous plants and they have therefore a gut full of poison which, if a predator comes along and eats them, causes the predator to remember not to ever eat that sort of locust again and being brightly coloured aids in that learning. In a few hours, the grasshopper has turned into a locust, but before it can swarm, the creature has one more major physiological change to make, which takes a few days. As the insect goes from being a solitary creature to being one of a crowd, or gregarious, its head actually changes. The shape of the pronotum, which is a structure on top of here, which is rounder and broader than this. As the change into the gregarious phase occurs, locusts band together. They orient towards each other and form groups, and it's these active groups that we see as flying swarms of adults. The benign grasshopper has now become a deadly scourge. Locusts have plagued humanity for centuries. Roman author and naturalist Pliny the Elder in the first century AD wrote about the worst cases of locust rot death and devastation ever known. In Libya, for example, in Kirinaika, over two million people died uh, after one of the desert locust invasions. Died from starvation because the locusts completely devastated uh, the agricultural areas. As human settlements and farming expanded across the continents, so too did the severity of insect plagues. When you go from hunter-gatherer to agriculture, concentrate your food sources and rely on that food source for subsistence agriculture, add a locust and you've got a disaster. America has not been immune to the threat of locusts. Huge swarms struck the pioneer settlers trying to farm the American West. The first Latter-day Saints, or Mormons, to enter Utah fought to save their precious crops from a wingless relative of the locust, known today as a Mormon cricket. The plague had come to the area, much like the great plagues that occurred in Egypt. For three weeks, insatiable bands of marching insects laid waste to the Mormons' crops. With their lives threatened by waves upon waves of the voracious pests, the Mormon settlers fought and prayed for deliverance from famine, starvation, and annihilation. Insect swarms have brought crisis and calamity to almost every continent on Earth. Locusts and other insects have catastrophically struck Europe, Asia, Australia, and the Americas at some point in history. Locust outbreaks have been recorded on every continent except Antarctica. But it is the African continent where the extreme climate conditions are ideal for locust procreation and population growth that has been hit the hardest. As the available vegetation for the insects grows scarcer, locusts crowd together and compete for the ever-diminishing food sources. When the multitude reaches critical mass and the food disappears, locusts will swarm.
Especially vulnerable are the arid nations in North Africa. In one outbreak alone in Algeria in 1867, 250,000 people died from starvation. When settlers first arrived in North America, they faced similar ordeals. As the early pioneers spread into the American West, they were plagued by huge swarms of insects. It would have been unprecedented in, in terms of their experiences. I can't imagine anyone having seen anything like this, even today. The first major encounter that was recorded occurred in Utah in the 1840s. The Latter-day Saints arrived in the Salt Lake Valley in July of 1847. In the interim, they had been planting crops with the idea that there would be literally thousands that would be coming to join them. By May 1848, a few hundred Mormon settlers had plowed and planted nearly 10,000 acres with crops, including wheat, corn, and assorted vegetables. Then, disaster struck. Out of the hills comes this black wave of creatures, a blanket across the prairie, and they're, and they're headed down through the draws, down into the valley. This black wave was a swarm of millions of grasshoppers, soon to be named Mormon crickets after the Latter-day Saints they plagued. It must have been pretty demoralizing. They uh, managed to get their first crop going, and this was a matter of life and death, of course. And just as it was ripening, over the hill came a vast horde of, of marching Mormon crickets, and that must have been pretty depressing. Unbeknownst to the settlers, outbreaks occur on average once every 30 years. When they occur, they can last for years at a time. If left unchecked, the mega swarms return every spring in ever greater numbers for as many as 20 years in a row. Since they hadn't been in the region before, what they didn't know is that Mormon crickets hatch in the spring as things warm up, and you often get migratory bands of Mormon crickets that move through various areas, which unfortunately for the Mormon settlers happened to be where they had grown their crops that year. The Mormon cricket, which appears to be a wingless desert locust, isn't actually a locust at all. Mormon crickets are technically katydids, or longhorn grasshoppers, and locusts are often in a, in a different group, just the regular grasshoppers or shorthorn grasshoppers. However, Mormon crickets behave like desert locusts in one very significant way. They undergo a dramatic physical metamorphosis when they get overcrowded. At low densities and most years up in the mountains, they're sort of green little, almost cricket-like, harmless insects, you know, um, hopping around the meadows. But once the conditions turn advantageous for them and they become crowded, they undergo this, this transformation into this black, dark brown, coffee brown form. Once this physiological change has occurred, they are ready to swarm. And they form groups that can be millions of individual crickets that are all marching in the same direction across the landscape. On average, a Mormon cricket is three times the size of a desert locust, and so can eat three times as much. Mormon cricket individuals can be up to three grams, and we know for a fact that a Mormon cricket can eat its body weight in food at least in a single meal, because a single Mormon cricket can cannibalize and consume the entire body of another similarly sized Mormon cricket in one meal. If an individual from a, from a band, a swarm, gets injured, they'll eat that individual. Other individuals will jump on and they'll eat each other. It turns out it's this cannibalism that's one of the driving mechanisms of movement within the band. The crickets need to keep moving in order to avoid being attacked by the crickets approaching from behind. So this whole process is basically a forced march driven by cannibalism. The terrifying thing is that there's basically no way to stop them. They're sort of like this, this living wave rolling across the ground of, of these black insects. They're omnivorous, meaning that they eat everything. They eat plants, they will eat carcasses. There's even reports of them biting humans and drawing blood. These early Mormon pioneers faced many tests, but the onslaught of the marching crickets was the most difficult. Pioneers who had buried children along the trail, who had endured cholera, all kinds of problems. They'd finally landed in a place where their leader, Brigham Young, who is viewed as the American Moses, was saying, this is the right place, only to find uh, it appeared uh, like perhaps a plague had come to the area, much like the great plagues in Egypt. For sure, many would have viewed it as a test of faith. 
For three long weeks, the insatiable crickets poured into the Salt Lake Valley. The crickets were directly taking foods from their mouth, potentially wiping out the food that they're trying to grow for the coming year. The question was how to stop them. They came up with several ideas, each one of them failed. The Mormons tried to bury, burn, and drown the crickets, but nothing could deter the onslaught. It just seemed like everything they tried didn't work. The result was they prayed to their Father in Heaven and asked for relief. According to Mormon accounts, after three weeks of constant plague, a flock of seagulls entered the valley and began to consume the hordes of swarming crickets. The seagulls kept coming, kept coming. Some accounts will have them flying all the way to the Great Salt Lake, dropping the crickets into the lake and then coming back to get more. For three weeks, the seagulls feasted on crickets. And by the end, all the crickets were gone from the valley. For members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, this was a miracle for them, at least viewed by the farmers as such. According to entomologists, there may be a natural explanation for what happened that year in Salt Lake Valley. That gull showed up and fed on the Mormon crickets that were in the early settlers' um, crops is, is probably almost certain. But whether the gulls eradicated the crickets alone or the crickets moved along and should share credit with the gulls themselves is, is up for debate. It may have been the case that the seagulls were gorging themselves on, on these crickets and, and certainly may have made enough of a dent in the population, at least locally, to have, uh, to have really made an impact in terms of, of keeping the Mormons from, from utter disaster. Science aside, for the Latter-day Saints there is no doubt it was a case of divine intervention. We call it the miracle of the gulls. So as a result, uh, Latter-day Saints continued to live in the valleys. But the Mormon cricket swarm of 1848 was just the lull before the storm. Greater horrors were about to beset American pioneers trying to settle and farm the lands across the West. When several years of wet weather were followed by severe drought, the perfect ecological conditions were set by the 1870s for a super swarm of a North America bred insect. It would come to be known in infamy as the Rocky Mountain Locust. If the Mormon cricket was bad, the Rocky Mountain Locust is absolute disaster. They can fly and so their capacity to move quickly and to move from field to field is, is even worse than the Mormon cricket. This time, tens of thousands would face famine and starvation. People were really scared of Rocky Mountain Locust. Farmers quickly realized that a swarm of ravenous Rocky Mountain Locusts could wipe out a year's worth of crops in a few hours. What's more, no one could predict when or where a swarm would strike. The unfortunate might see the locust uh, arriving uh, this year, next year, maybe only a two-year break and then they're back again. Other places, and it might be six, seven, eight years before another locust uh, swarm arrives. Making matters worse, swarms of Rocky Mountain locusts were massive. These insects arrive by the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. With each unconstrained outbreak, the locust swarms caused ever more damage. Then, in 1875, pioneers on the American frontier faced the largest swarm ever seen. It's 1,800 miles long. The sun itself becomes blocked, biological eclipse of the sun, something that had never been experienced by these people and has never been experienced on the North American continent. In 1875, in the Rocky Mountains, the sun was blocked for five days by the largest swarm ever seen on Earth. So it was a phenomenal, um, one of the largest uh, masses of animal life that's ever been recorded. It came to be known as Albert's Swarm. Named after a Nebraska physician who measured the onslaught. Albert Child uh, turned out to be not very interested in locusts at all, but what he was really in love with was meteorology. He was a, a weather watcher, an early climatologist, a reporter of weather conditions. Child first sighted the swarm in Nebraska on June 15, 1875. Child, of course, sees a swarm as sort of a climatic or a weather event. So what he does is he measures um, as accurately as he can the flight speed of the locusts that are passing over. And he does this based on both their flight speed and his measurements of wind speed. Child calculated that the swarm front was moving at 15 miles an hour. 
But how wide is the front? That's what he can't tell. So he telegraphs east and west to find sort of where the swarm drops off. And so that gives him a width. So now he knows how wide the front is of locust swarm, and he knows how fast it's passing over. Child knew that if he waited to see how long it took for the swarm to pass overhead, he could measure its length. He waited five days. And when he does the numbers, the swarm is at least 100 miles wide, and then it's 1,800 miles long. Using a telescope and a measured distant point on a hill, Dr. Child calculated the height of the swarm as a mile and a half high. Entomologists today have come up with their own estimate for the total number of insects in the 1875 super swarm. The biggest swarm of the Rocky Mountain locust contained about 3.5 trillion individuals. Albert's swarm stretched across the length of the western United States. In total, an area encompassing 198,000 square miles. It was pouring out of Texas. Um, and it was riding a, a very particular weather system that provides a stable mm, conveyor belt of, of air passing northward um, over Kansas, Nebraska, and up into the Dakotas. For American farmers on the western frontier trying to plant their crops in June 1875, the sight of the largest swarm in human history would have been terrifying. The locusts are coming over the horizon, a brownish, yellowish cloud descending on this land, and then you begin to hear the swarm, the farmers figure out pretty quickly this is not a storm, at least it's not a, a weather storm, it's a biological storm. And then blankets of locusts come. They're coming everywhere, crawling on you, in your hair, into your clothes, through everything and everywhere. Making the situation worse for the settlers, no one knew where this ravenous super swarm would touch down. It makes it seem somehow magical or, or evil. One district can be absolutely decimated, a district a, a short distance away may suffer almost no damage, sort of like a twister. Some eyewitnesses claim that the swarm feasted on wood, fabric, and flesh. They'll eat anything with moisture. It's been reported they'll even chew on the handles of tools, almost polishing them to a, to a glean. And they're doing that probably to extract the salts left behind after, after perspiration. But it was the settlers' crops that provided the locusts with the best source of food. By some estimates, 300,000 acres of farmland had been devastated. In 1875, half of all Western agricultural production was lost to the locusts. Thousands of settlers on the American frontier now faced famine. They're looking at their food for the coming year disappearing. They're not facing bankruptcy, they're facing death by starvation. Stationed out west, U.S. Army General E.O.C. Ord was so shocked by the suffering that in October 1875, he petitioned the government back east for aid. 100,000 settlers were at risk. And so what Ord did was to convince the government, first of all, to release um, U.S. military property in terms of clothing and shoes to protect the people from the oncoming cold. Thanks to General Ord's pleas, for the first time in American history, the U.S. government sent the army on a relief mission. In that winter, um, about two million food rations were distributed throughout um, the locust-impacted areas. Despite the best efforts by General Ord and the army, historians estimate that several hundred Americans may have died of starvation in the 1875 plague. No official numbers were ever reported. While the locust swarm of 1875 would be the worst in terms of crops destroyed and lives lost, it would not be the last on the American frontier. Somewhere in the West, the locust was probably doing damage every three to five years, with major outbreaks probably occurring every six to eight years. For farms to flourish and the West to be settled, the locusts had to be controlled. In 1887, Congress created the United States Entomological Commission and appointed scientist Charles Valentine Riley to solve the locust problem. C.V. Riley was the first person to systematically investigate the biology of the locust to figure out how to control them. Riley was the first to detail the three life stages of the locust, egg, nymph, and adult. By tracking the locust across the country, he also discovered the creature's breeding ground. Riley found that the locust originated from fertile river valleys high up in the Rocky Mountains. 
when the conditions turned right for, for its populations to reach high numbers, um, high densities, which would trigger the transformation into the migratory phase, it would come pouring out of those mountain valleys down across the prairies in search of food. On the way, the locusts seed the ground with the next generation. They'll mate and they'll lay egg. The cycle continues. If you multiply that by millions, then you, you end up with a lot of locusts. The way to stop the locusts, Riley concluded, was to destroy their egg pods. The time to attack the Rocky Mountain locust is before it emerges from the ground. They understand that it's the egg stage that's the vulnerable stage. Riley's findings spurred a massive effort by farmers to stop the locust eggs from hatching. Slews of ingenious machines that sucked, burnt, and poisoned were dispatched west to try to eradicate the pests that plagued the frontier farmers. They're clever, but I'm not really sure if they really worked. Then, suddenly, the Rocky Mountain locust vanished. In a period of about 10, 15 years, the most phenomenally abundant insect in the history of North America went from breathtaking numbers to extinction. Its death was almost instantaneous. The last known sighting of the Rocky Mountain locust was in 1902. A small swarm was seen flying through Manitoba, Canada. It would be the last locust swarm ever sighted in North America. Some attributed the demise of the locust to the government's eradication program. But many experts today believe that the real reason was deceptively simple. The farmers who moved into the valley crushed the locust eggs when they plowed their fields. At the same time, livestock are moving in, so they're, they're grazing in the streamside areas. They're trampling this habitat of the Rocky Mountain locust. The American pioneers who had witnessed the biggest swarm ever seen had their revenge on the locust. They survived and thrived. But locust swarms of catastrophic proportions still occur all over the world. The people who are most affected by these swarms are often the subsistence farmers, people who are reliant on their local food production for the food that they need to survive. In order to save precious lives, scientists today are conducting a host of high-tech experiments that may unlock the mystery of why locusts swarm. This research could be critical. Some experts believe that if the climatic and ecological conditions are right, we could be on the verge of another catastrophic plague of locusts in the United States. Experts estimate that 20% of the Earth's land mass is within striking range of locusts. If the worst happens and a swarm strikes across continents, one in 10 of the world's population could face famine and even death. If you imagine a large swarm sweeping through a, uh, underdeveloped nations, which rely on agriculture, people will starve. The most destructive species is the desert locust, the locust of the biblical plague. When there's an outbreak, it can cover about 20% of the Earth's dry land in more than 60 countries. When a swarm does strike, local governments and aid organizations may find their methods used to fight the infestation inadequate. Typically, pesticides are used. Go out with airplanes and spray huge swaths of area to knock the locust back. And it's not a good solution because locusts will eventually develop resistance to the pesticides. There's also high cost, both economically and also possibly environmentally, of, of using such approaches. Scientists are trying to fight locust outbreaks by studying their biological process of phase change. Once we understand those factors, we can potentially manipulate them to reduce the severity of outbreaks or possibly prevent them at all. The process of phase change is really central to what a locust is and how swarms form. The most important trait of all the traits that can change when locusts become crowded is their behavior. What is it that signals the locust to transform itself? What it comes down to apparently is, is two key features. Um, one of those, the earliest one discovered, was odor. Um, the grasshoppers, when they defecate, um, their feces produces an odor um, that basically signals them that they're becoming crowded. When your habitat starts smelling like a sewer, you know there's a lot of you. The other thing that they probably cue on, and this is more recent research, is actually tactile or touch. 
Well, the process we found was induced by touching the back legs, and there are special hairs on the back legs that induce this effect and it's become known as the G-spot of the locust, G for Gregorization in this case. Some experts reason that this stimulation sets off a chemical and physiological chain reaction inside the body. Scientists have discovered that weather directly impacts the phase change process and population density of the desert locust. You've got to have rainfall in order to have plant growth for the locusts to feed on, and you have to have moisture in the soil for their eggs to develop. Given a number of generations of good breeding conditions caused by good rain and suitable vegetation and moisture for egg development, um, the populations can build up and boom. On average, swarms occur every seven to 10 years, but it depends on climate. If a few years of rainfall are followed by drought, the gregarious locusts get anxious to migrate. As conditions become drier, the area of suitable habitat for locusts contracts. So the locusts, they're going to become crowded and ultimately come in contact with each other. And it's this contact among the individual locusts that causes them to shift from the non-migratory to the migratory phase. So this changes their behavior. They start to form large mobile groups that we see as swarms. And these swarms are migratory. They then take off from the habitat where they started and end up in new places. Today, even though the infamous Rocky Mountain locust is believed to be extinct, farmers face a new danger from Mormon crickets, which have returned in huge numbers. In the western U.S., we've been going through a big Mormon cricket outbreak over the last several years. Typically, Utah, Nevada, Idaho um, tend to be the hardest hit. The latest upsurge peaked in about 2004. And at that point, there were major outbreaks in, in a majority of the western states. And that year, about $20 million was allocated by the federal government alone for Mormon cricket control. In a field study in Nevada, Greg Sword and Steve Simpson head a team of scientists who use state-of-the-art technology to try and track the migration patterns of Mormon crickets. We need to know where they're going and what determines the direction that these groups might travel over time. And to do that, we use small radio transmitters and we can actually glue them to individual insects, much like you might put a radio collar on a bear and track its movement over time using radio telemetry. And if you know where the source and the destination is, you can predict what areas might repeatedly be sources of locust outbreaks and where those locusts are then going to go. And we can use that information to improve their management. What we're doing now is we're going to glue a radio transmitter on it and shortly after putting the transmitter on it, we're going to release it into the band. So we put a little drop of hot glue, the radio on its back, orient the antenna so it's down the body. We're good to go. Navigation. Ah. Things are happening. Greg Sword believes that genetics may hold the key to stopping the global swarming of the locust. We're able to look at its DNA and we can use this information to identify the specific genes that are turned on that result in the expression of migratory behavior. Ultimately, it may be possible to manipulate the expression of this behavior at the genetic level. In other words, stop them swarming. But control techniques remain in their infancy and it may take many years before this research yields practical results. Meanwhile, some scientists warn there is a more immediate area of concern. They believe that global warming is increasing locust populations worldwide, and it is also changing their migration patterns. They say it could drive swarms of Central American locusts into North America. There's even outbreaks going on right now in the Yucatan Peninsula area of Mexico. Some experts predict that with global warming changing climate patterns, locust swarms could once again sweep through the western United States. Scientists fear locust populations could explode in the near future. If so, every continent on Earth would be in the danger zone. Some experts believe this could herald the return of locust swarms to the United States in the form of the so-called Central American locust. We do have some indication that species distributions in North America are shifting. In particular, species are shifting further northward. A recent study of the geographic distribution of grasshoppers points to an ominous trend. Dan Johnson, who's a researcher in Canada, has 
done more recent grasshopper surveys and compared them back to surveys of some decades ago and has found that a number of species are being found further north in Canada than they used to be. With the right climatic conditions, locust numbers build. When this happens, the insect senses increased competition for food supplies. Then, a tipping point is reached, and each insect quickly changes its shape, color, and behavior. Once completed, the locusts form one giant swarm and take off. If the size of the swarm is big, if it contains several million individuals, then of course people will freak out. Entomologists fear that in this worst-case scenario, a swarm of Central American locusts could head north in search of food and water. Let's say this locust outbreak moves up from, from Mexico into the southwestern United States. Locust swarms moving into Houston, moving into Phoenix and Tucson, San Diego, Los Angeles. It would be frightening, it would be incomprehensible, it would be terrifying. The sky darkens as the insect tornado closes in on the city. If they reach big cities, they can really create a havoc. They're ubiquitous, they go everywhere, they fly, they hit you in, the, in your face, they hit you in your body. Crawling into your clothes, under your clothes, into window screens, piling up against your house. So many locusts landed on the roads and cars then drove over the locusts and caused slick driving conditions, you might get some more traffic accidents. Propelled by winds, the locusts could cover a hundred miles a day, landing to feed, breed, and lay eggs. When the eggs hatch and locusts grow, this perfect mega swarm could have billions of wingless nymphs charging and chomping through field and farm. People in U.S., governments and cities are not equipped to deal with locusts because it's not real, it's unlikely. And they probably don't know how to deal with it. Emergency services, desperate to avert total catastrophe, may propose deploying airplanes loaded with pesticides to spray the swarms of locusts. We have all sorts of bureaucratic and, and sound environmental reasons why large-scale spraying can't simply be done on an emergency basis. It requires permissions, it requires environmental justification, it requires a great deal of documentation. We probably don't have enough aircraft available for this either in terms of dealing with this. When locusts are already airborne, then chemical pesticides will not be that effective. The other problem with chemical control is that you may not have a long-term control. You knock the populations down, but some research indicates that you may actually make it a little bit more likely you'd have an outbreak in the future. Public anxiety would grow. This familiar sense of fear, loss of control, panic, blame. What's causing this? Who's in charge? Why isn't something being done? Experts estimate that the nation's 200 million and more acres of crops could be decimated. Our supply of important crops will be basically gone in a matter of few days. Billions of dollars would be lost in agriculture alone, and thousands of ranchers and farmers could lose their livelihoods. Food shortages and famine could follow. The impact uh, in terms of its duration could be one, two, three years. Would the locust swarm cause hunger? Not for us. Would the locust swarm cause hunger elsewhere as we have the money to buy food that may be limited for other people? That becomes much more likely. So my sense is that we would transfer the hunger to poor countries. This scenario is still just hypothetical. For centuries, millions of people the world over have witnessed, endured, and suffered the devastation and death carried by locust swarms. But scientists know that they must find ways to stop the next super swarm. We can read about outbreaks in the Bible. And obviously, the fact that we haven't solved it yet indicates it's a really complex problem. We need to have a better understanding of the basic ecological processes that are occurring before outbreaks so we can prevent an outbreak from occurring in the first place.